Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Strife Hayes, and this is a complete beginner's guide to the MMORPG World of Warcraft. This guide is designed for people who have never played World of Warcraft before and may be unfamiliar with the MMORPG genre in general. I'm going to cover absolutely everything you could need to know to help you begin your adventure with confidence. I won't look at any endgame builds, specific dungeons, or classes. Instead, I'll explain the general gameplay mechanics you'll be faced with and what you should expect as a new player. World of Warcraft is an online game, and so is constantly receiving updates and patches. Because of this, information in this guide may become outdated or irrelevant. If this happens, I'll make an updated one listing any major changes. This guide will be extremely long and detailed. If you know what you're looking for, use the time codes in the description below to jump straight there. If you're new to World of Warcraft, or MMORPGs in general, I suggest you grab a cup of tea and settle in. We have a lot to cover. The free trial and the expansions. World of Warcraft is a subscription game, meaning you'll pay a small monthly fee to play. However, you can start a trial account and play up to level 20 for free. For the purpose of this guide, level 20 will be all we need. The base game of World of Warcraft came out in 2004, and has received several major expansions since, expanding both the story and the world size. In order of release they are The Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King, Cataclysm, Mists of Pandaria, Warlords of Draenor, Legion, and the latest at the time of this guide, Battle for Azeroth. Once you reach level 20 in your free trial and decide to pay the subscription, you'll gain access to every expansion except the latest one for free. This means you only need to pay for the newest major expansion. All previous ones are included as part of your subscription. You don't have to play through every expansion. You can jump straight to the latest one and play with everyone else. But you're welcome to go back and complete the old content in your own time. Once you've downloaded the game and signed up for a Battle.net account, you're ready to log in and start making your character. Making a character. World of Warcraft takes place in the fictional land of Azeroth. Azeroth contains two main warring factions, the Alliance and the Horde. These factions began all the way back in the Warcraft real-time strategy game, and when you play World of Warcraft, you will be affiliated with one side or the other. In general broad terms, the Alliance are in support of central leadership and bureaucracy, and the Horde are in favour of independent tribes and individual freedoms. You will only be able to cooperate with other players of the same faction. If you find a player of the opposing faction, you'll be able to attack and try to kill them. While in a city of your faction, you'll be safe. If you head to any city of the opposing faction, the city guards will try to kill you. Your allegiance to either the Horde or the Alliance is determined by which race you play as. Race. Alliance races are humans, dwarves, night elves, gnomes, draenei, and worgen, while the Horde is made up of orcs, undead, Tauren, Trolls, Blood Elves, and Goblins. Your race will limit your class selection and determine your starting area. Your early game experience will be mainly focused around other players of the same race as you, but as you level up, you'll meet the rest of your faction. If you choose to play as a neutral Pandaren, you'll have to choose to support either the Alliance or the Horde once you leave your starting zone. Class. Once you've decided on a race, you'll need to pick a class. Your class will determine your combat role and style. Certain classes are limited to certain races. Only Night Elves or Blood Elves can become Demon Hunters, Gnomes cannot become Paladins, and so on. When you select a race on the left-hand side, you'll see which classes are available for it on the right. Which class is best is always shifting, so don't worry about optimizing yet, just play what you like. With race and class chosen, click Customize at the bottom and change around various aesthetic features of your character. 
give them a name, and then click Finish to begin your adventure. Starting at level 1. When you enter the world, you'll be placed into your race-specific starting zone. Let's break the gameplay down and cover everything step by step. Movement uses the W, A, S and D keys. Spacebar is jump. The cursor is not locked to the camera. Holding left click, however, will allow you to move the camera around your character. And holding right click will move the camera while locked behind your character. Holding both left and right click together will make you run forward. With movement being super simple, let's look at the user interface. User interface. To the top left, you'll see your character portrait and status. The little number in the circle is your level. The green bar is your health, and then each class will have a different bar underneath and possibly some different looking symbols. The Death Knight will have the runic power bar and death runes, warriors will have their rage bar, mages have mana, and so on. You'll learn what your class does and what this bar represents as you play. The bottom left is the chat box, broken down into tabs. As standard, you'll have the general chat and combat log. General chat allows you to press enter, type something, then press enter again and it will appear above your head. There are various things you can do with the chat box. For a complete list of commands, just type forward slash help. Just above and left of the chat box is your social button, shortcut key O. This lists your added friends, showing who's online and letting you whisper or private message them. To the bottom middle of the screen, you'll see your hotbar, possibly the most useful part of the screen. These blank spaces are all buttons and can be filled up with your various skills and abilities, then linked to a certain key. The standard key binding links them to the numbers 1 to 9. During combat, you'll use all these abilities, discussed in the combat section of this guide. To the right of the hotbar, you'll see two small arrows. These allow you to cycle through six possible hotbar combinations, meaning you can tailor your ability setup for any given situation. Underneath the hotbar is your experience bar, showing how close you are to your next level. The bottom right of the screen contains 11 small buttons. Let's quickly go over each of them. Character info brings up all the currently equipped items and shows the stats of your character, showing what you have in each slot and the values these give you in total. Hover your mouse over your attributes and enhancements for a more thorough breakdown of exactly what they do and where they come from. The top right of this panel has three tabs. Character stats you're already on. Titles are earned through various quests or achievements in-game and will allow you to have a prefix or suffix after your in-game name. And once you reach level 15, Equipment Manager allows you to create and then save various equipment combinations, then switch between them in a single click. The bottom left of this panel shows the Reputation tab. You're standing with the multiple smaller factions in the game. Completing quests for or helping out a smaller faction will increase your standing with them, which may unlock certain titles, rewards or achievements. If you want to track your progress with a faction, you can click on one, then select Show as Experience Bar. The faction progress will now appear under your hotbar, just above your experience bar. Spellbook and Abilities shows what attacks you will be able to perform or passive buffs you're receiving and can be accessed quickly by pressing P. The spellbook is broken down into various tabs shown on the right hand side. The general tab is based off your race and class and will list both activated and passive skills. An activated skill can be clicked on then dragged to the hotbar at the bottom. Now clicking on it or pressing the keybind will use it. Some activated skills have a cooldown time you'll have to wait until you can use them again. Passive skills don't need to be activated. They're constantly applied to you. Underneath General, you'll see your Active Specialization tab. Specializations are specific builds of each class and allow you to focus more on one style of gameplay. We'll talk about them more in the combat section of this guide, but here's the quick version. 
As a new player, you'll already be set to a single specialization. At level 10, you'll be able to switch to various others. You can see the abilities each specialization has by clicking through the tabs in your spellbook, and you can see the levels those skills will unlock for you. As you level up, remember to click and drag your new abilities to your hotbar. The bottom of the spellbook and abilities panel shows your professions tab. You can have two professions at any time. Professions are discussed later in the professions section of this guide. Specialization and talents shows you what your class can focus on, allowing you to fill various roles within the combat holy trinity discussed later. You'll need to be at least level 10 to access this panel, and can switch between specializations any time you're in a safe place. Each specialization will bring different activated and passive skills. The tab at the bottom left will show you your talent list, and works like this. Every few levels, shown by the number on the left, you'll gain access to a new talent layer. You can only activate one talent in each row. Talents may be passive buffs or new activated attacks. If the talent is an activated attack, remember to drag it to your hotbar so you can use it. Each class and specialization will have an optimal talent setup. Check a class guide for advice and guidance. I'll leave all the specific class guides linked in the video description below. If you're playing the Battle for Azeroth expansion, on the right hand side you'll see PvP talents. These will only apply when you're involved in player versus player combat. Underneath you'll see the War Mode toggle switch. You can only turn this on or off at your faction's main city, Orgrimmar for Horde and Stormwind for the Alliance. While War Mode is active, you can attack and be attacked by any player of the opposing faction, but you'll also gain experience at a slightly faster rate. Achievements, quick key Y, lists everything you could do in the game. You can switch between personal achievements, guild achievements, and in-game stats using the tabs at the bottom. Then click on any of the subcategories on the left to expand and see a more detailed breakdown of what you need to do. Completing every achievement in World of Warcraft is a monumental task, and as of this guide, a Russian player managed to do it in only six years. Your quest log and map will be your guide for every quest in the game, hotkey L or M. The map is broken down into the flow line you see at the top, and you can click any drop-down arrow to jump to a different part of the world. If you lose track of where you are, simply close, then reopen the map. The map shows important local information, including where you are, any quests, either completed or waiting to be started, and all local flight paths, shown as small shoes with wings. These are quick transport routes from one to another. On the right hand side, you'll see a quest breakdown of all your currently active quests, sorted by map location. Clicking on a specific quest will bring up all the information about that quest, including all the important dialogue and how much experience you'll receive for completing it. Active tracked quests are shown on the right hand side of your in-game screen. Clicking a quest in your quest list and choosing track or untrack will add or remove it from your in-game display. To locate a certain quest, on the map and quest log panel, click the little number or question mark to the left of the quest name. This will place a yellow circle around it on your map. Any quests that require you to be in a certain area in general will have that area highlighted in blue, and hovering your mouse over the blue area will show you what you're required to do once you're there. The Guild and Communities button, hotkey J lists any guilds you're a part of. Guilds are simply a collection of players. As you level, you can either create your own guild, or be invited to join an existing one. World of Warcraft is a heavily social game, and having a guild to play with makes things much more fun. The next button is Group Finder, 
and will be discussed in the Dungeons and Raids section of this guide. Collections is a list of all the items and fashion choices you've found so far in the game. You can visit a major city and transmogrify your items, meaning to keep the stats of one item but gain the looks of another. The bottom of this panel shows five tabs. Mounts shows all possible things you can ride or fly around on and where to get each one. As mounts are activated abilities, the icon must be dragged to the hotbar and then activated. Pet Journal is a game mechanic involving finding pet drops from around the world and then leveling those pets up and fighting other players' pets, and is discussed in the Pet Battles section of this guide. Toy Box lists the non-essential fun items you can gather from various vendors. Heirlooms are expensive items and weapons you can purchase and then use on any character. Heirlooms are purchased often on your higher level characters, then equipped by your lower level characters to make the leveling process much faster, as heirlooms increase the amount of experience you gain. The Appearances tab will show all possible aesthetic overrides you can find for your class. Once you've found a piece of armor or weapon and equipped it, you'll unlock the override to be used again. You can cycle through the item locations using the circle buttons at the top. And by holding shift, then left clicking a piece of armor or weapon, you can see what it would look like on your character. The weapon and shield circle selection buttons will have small scroll buttons to the top right. These are weapon enhancements. They can be found as rare drops from a variety of places and they add particle effects to your weapons. The Sets tab at the top shows you various complete item sets you can find. Select a set, then hover your cursor over each set item icon on the right to see where to find it. Each set that drops from a dungeon will have different tiers. Raid Finder, Normal, Heroic or Mythic. Click the drop-down menu at the top right of this panel to see how each tier looks different. The Mythic armor sets are usually the most visually striking. They're also the hardest to find. The Adventure Guide is an extremely useful button whenever you're unsure of where to go. The Suggested Content tab shows all things appropriate and recommended for your level. And the Dungeons or Raids tab lists every dungeon and raid in the game and all the bosses you'll face. This is discussed in detail in the Dungeons and Raids section of this guide. The Shop button lets you browse around and spend real money to buy additional extras and the game menu opens the menu. Neither of these need to be discussed. Above those buttons are your backpack bags. You can open your backpack bags individually by clicking on each one or open all of them by pressing B. Each bag icon to the top left of its panel can be clicked on and lets you customize what that bag can or cannot hold. It's best not to mess with this too early in the game. Any new bags you find or buy will need to be dragged to one of the empty bag slots to the left of the main backpack icon. The quest overlay on the right hand side we've already talked about in relation to the map and quest log, but if you don't like the active quests taking up screen space, you can click the little roll up button to minimize it. The top right shows the minimap, along with your current in-game location, calendar, date and in-game time. To change how detailed the minimap is, click the magnifying glass icon. You can now choose what does and does not appear on the minimap. Expanding the Townsfolk option will allow you to select which kind of NPCs are specifically shown, making it easier to find a local bank or merchant. That's everything you need to know about the user interface and what each button does. Now, let's look at equipping items, weapons and armor. Equipping items. Your character's power will be heavily linked to the weapons, armor and accessories you equip and you'll find lots of items, from quest rewards or dropped by defeated enemies. Open the character panel, then your backpack. 
The character info panel will show you all the places you could put equipment. Head, neck, shoulders, back, chest, shirt, tabard, wrists, hands, waist, legs, feet, rings and trinkets. Then finally, a main hand and off hand weapon. As a new player, you won't fill each of these slots up immediately. Hover your mouse over any equipable item in your backpack. That item's tooltip will pop up and tell you which slot it goes into and what material it's made of. Each class is limited to what type of material they can wear. See the screen now for a list of all the classes and the armor types they can wear. When hovering over an item, you'll see its name in a certain color. This color relates to the rarity or quality of that item. From worst to best, it goes poor in gray, common is white, uncommon green, rare blue, epic purple, legendary orange, artifact gold, and heirloom and wow token items are light blue. The better an item is, the more additional stats it will have. The item level is a general guide for how useful that item is. Higher is usually better. At low levels, just equip the highest. But at the end of the game, you'll want to carefully evaluate the stats each item gives you. All numerical values that item then gives you are listed below. Some of these values may be greyed out. This happens when the item could potentially give you this boost, but your class doesn't need that stat, so simply won't receive it. Item durability shows how much punishment this piece can take before it breaks. Durability goes down slowly whenever you take damage or die. At zero durability, the item won't be destroyed, but it will stop providing any bonuses. You can fix items at any NPC who sells armor or weapons, or most blacksmiths. The sell price of an item is what you'll get if you sell this item to a merchant. Most low-leveled equipment can be sold without problem. At higher levels, it's heavily suggested to list items on the auction house instead, explained later in this guide. If you have no item equipped in a slot, then equip something. If you have an item already in a slot, but could equip something else, hover your cursor over the new item in your backpack and hold down the shift key. You'll be shown your currently equipped item and then a list of changes that will happen if you equip the new item instead. Red changes are negative, green changes are positive. This lets you see at a glance which piece is best for you right now. Items, just like abilities, can be dragged to the hotbar and swapped between quickly. This is not commonly done, but is possible if you want to. Interacting with the world. While playing World of Warcraft, you'll be able to interact with the huge complex world in various ways. The three main areas of interaction are NPCs, or non-playable characters, other human players, or the game world itself. Let's look at each of these. NPCs will have their name displayed above their head. Green names are friendly, yellow are neutral, and red are aggressive. We'll discuss enemies in the combat section. If that specific NPC happens to have a job, it'll be displayed under their name in pointed brackets. Left-clicking on an NPC will target it. You'll see their picture and stats appear in the top left near your portrait, showing their level and health. If you're close enough to them, left-clicking will also interact with them. Shopkeepers will open the shop interface, and quest givers will talk to you. Selling items to a merchant is as simple as right-clicking on the item in your inventory that you want to sell. If you sell something by mistake, you can click the Buy Back tab on the merchant panel and purchase it back. Not every NPC has something to say, but sometimes clicking on them repeatedly can often lead to hidden, funny dialogue. This is a reference to the Warcraft real-time strategy games that gave you funny dialogue if you clicked on one unit repeatedly. Interacting with players is similar. 
click the player to target them, and then make the portrait icon appear. However, you can now right click on the portrait icon and access a few more options. Add friend adds this player to your social menu, hotkey O. While targeting a player, you can request to join their group, allowing you to adventure or explore instance-based places like dungeons together, whisper them a message, inspect allows you to see all the equipment they're currently wearing, compare achievements contrasts what you've done against what they've done, trade allows you to swap items between you, follow allows you to automatically follow behind them when they walk, and duel lets you both fight. The loser of a duel isn't killed, just removed to very low health. Interacting with the game world could mean picking up quest items, activating levers or pressing buttons, and gathering profession materials. Often, you can interact with something when your cursor turns into a small silver cog icon. The cog will turn gold whenever you're close enough to interact, using either left or right click. Dead enemies can also be interacted with and will often contain items or loot. The body will sparkle if there is something to be looted. Move close enough and interact with the body to see what they're carrying, and then click it to take it. To save time, you can turn on Auto Loot, which automatically takes all items of any defeated enemy you interact with. Press Escape to open the menu, choose Interface, then Controls, and tick the Auto Loot box. That's friendly NPCs, players, and the game world covered, leaving only enemies. So now, it's time to discuss combat. Combat. If an NPC has an orange name, then it's neutral. It won't attack you on sight, but it will defend itself if you attack it. An NPC with a red name is an enemy, and will attack you once you're within range. World of Warcraft uses a tab-targeting combat system, meaning by pressing the tab key, you'll lock on to the nearest enemy. Any melee single-target attacks you now perform will be directed toward this enemy, providing you're close enough to use them. If you're a ranged fighter, like a ranger or a mage, your attacks will go toward whatever enemy you're locked onto. You can press tab again to cycle through all available targets, and you will lock onto whatever you're facing the camera at. Once locked onto an enemy, the cursor will turn into a sword when you hover over them. Getting close and clicking will start the auto attack. You'll keep hitting them with a weak basic attack. While auto attack is easy, it's not what you want to be using. Remember the abilities and talents you dragged to the hotbar earlier? This is where you use them. Let's take an in-depth look at combat. The Holy Trinity. World of Warcraft uses a gameplay combat archetype known as the Holy Trinity. This means each character will fall into one of three general combat roles, tanks, healers, or damage dealers, shortened to DPS, which stands for damage per second. When playing solo content, this won't matter too much. Every class can progress through the game's story with little outside help, but once combat gets tough, or dungeons become challenging, you'll need to rely on the Holy Trinity. The job of a tank is to grab the enemy's attention and then not die. Tanks often have incredibly high defense and large amounts of health. Their attacks and abilities are designed to hold the attention of the enemies and keep all the attention on them. But they don't do much damage. So while they can draw a crowd, they can't kill them quickly. The healer is focused on keeping the rest of the party alive, starting with the tank. The healer won't have much health or do too much damage themselves, but they will excel at refilling other players' health bars and shielding them from damage. The healer will often be on the outskirts of combat, making sure the tank doesn't die, and quickly healing any DPS players who somehow manage to get hurt. And finally, the DPS. These players are focused on one main thing, hitting as hard as possible, and killing stuff. 
DPS classes often have less armor and average size health pools, but can deal with enemies extremely quickly, providing they aren't being attacked themselves. They can give damage out, but can't take it. They must rely on a tank to keep the enemy's attention. There are some classes that fill two of these roles, or specialize in one but in an unusual way. For example, the Demon Hunter can tank by dealing damage and healing themselves through the siphoning health of the enemy. The Mage can focus on slowing down enemies or building up arcane power and barraging for huge bursts of damage. That's powerful, but not sustainable. Remember we talked about specializations earlier, accessed at level 10 by pressing the N key? Well, each class has several specializations, and these can change which part of the Holy Trinity you can fill. Havoc Demon Hunters are DPS, but Vengeance Demon Hunters are tanks. Finding which part of the combat triangle you enjoy is key to succeeding at dungeons, raids, and having fun. DPS are often considered easier to play, and so there are an abundance of DPS players running around. Tanks are usually considered the leaders of the group, and is a more difficult role, and healers get to decide who lives and who dies. Play with each class to level 20 and get a feel for what you like and which part of the Holy Trinity you are going to play. Once you've tab-targeted an enemy, you'll be able to see the enemy's level and health bar. The more dangerous or powerful the enemy is, the more ornate their portrait frame will be. When attacking any enemy, it's important to keep an eye on their aggro. Aggro is the term we use for how likely an enemy is to attack any specific player. You build up the enemy's aggro against you by attacking it, and if you manage to harm it enough to gain its attention and make it start attacking you, that's known as pulling aggro. In general, the tank should always have the aggro. Tank classes have special shout attacks that instantly grab the enemy back, and tank attacks generate more aggro despite doing less damage. If a DPS player is doing too much damage, it's actually tactical to slow down and allow the tank to build up some more aggro, just to be safe. Whatever class you're playing, in any given situation you will have an optimal order of attacks, combining your various abilities, timing the cooldowns of one ability with the use of another, and knowing which attack, ability or talent to use next. This will be known as your rotation. Learning your rotation will allow you to put out maximum damage, steal maximum aggro, or heal with maximum efficiency. Enemies can broadly be divided into three categories. Mobs, elites, and bosses. A mob is a low-level enemy or group of enemies. They'll attack together if you aggro any specific member of the mob. The tank player should make sure they have all the members of a mob focused on them before the DPS start to kill them, or the DPS risk pulling aggro from the tank and being killed by the mob. An elite is a slightly tougher enemy, not a boss yet, but much harder than a standard mob. An elite enemy should often be treated like a mini-boss. And finally, boss enemies. These are the huge, complicated set fights against named creatures, often taking place within dungeons or raids and linked heavily to the story. World of Warcraft is known for its complex boss mechanics and stunning set-piece fights. It takes a skilled team to take down the boss of any dungeon. Everyone needs to play their part well. If you've been damaged during a fight, you can rely on the healer to refill your health or you can take responsibility for your own health and eat some food. Basic healing items include mana cookies, generated by a mage and given for free to the party. Healing items can give you a slight edge if you're not quite succeeding, but you won't need to worry about them too much until the end game. Quests and leveling up. 
World of Warcraft is all about your epic journey to save Azeroth from whatever danger it happens to be in right now, and you start that task by completing quests. Quests can range from small, local, five-minute tasks to huge, multi-planet spanning adventures. But let's start simple. Quest givers are NPCs with yellow exclamation marks above their heads. Sometimes, a quest will be started by interacting with an item in your inventory. But again, you'll see the universal yellow explanation point symbol. All quest givers will explain what they need, any enemies they need you to kill or resource they need you to collect, and you'll see how much money or experience you'll receive from completing that quest. Accept it, and the quest will be added to the quest list on the right-hand side of the screen. If the selected active quest needs you to be in a certain part of the map, the main map and the mini-map will both have that area highlighted in blue. The majority of quests will have you killing a certain number of enemies or collecting a certain number of quest-specific resources. These are often known as fetch quests. Once the conditions of the quest have been completed, you'll go and hand it in. Quest receivers have a yellow question mark above their head. It will often be the same person who gave you the quest, but it might be another NPC somewhere else in the world. Early game questing is very simple, and designed to lead you around the starting zone at a decent pace, levelling you just fast enough to progress quickly, but never feel overwhelming. If you've out-leveled a zone, such as returning to the start area when you're already max level, then the quests won't be shown to you. Experience-wise, they're not worth doing. But if you'd like to complete them all anyway, click the magnifying glass icon on your minimap, and make sure Show Trivial Quests is selected. This will allow you to see all quests, even low-leveled ones. Once you've leveled up a bit using quests, you'll be ready for dungeons, and eventually, raids. Dungeons and Raids World of Warcraft is known for its dungeon and raid content. Huge, difficult, player versus enemy challenges that take a team of experienced players to complete. As a new player, you won't need to worry about raids, but I'll explain them later just so you know what they are. A dungeon is a short, self-contained adventure zone normally following a linear path from start to finish, where you'll fight several smaller bosses along the way and a large main boss at the end. You'll be able to begin taking on dungeons when you reach level 15, starting with the Dead Mines and Ragefire Chasm. For a complete list of all dungeons in the game, along with what bosses they contain and what rewards you can earn, open the Adventure Guide by clicking the button or using the shortcut Shift-J. Then click the Dungeons tab. You can change the drop-down menu in the top right to cycle through all the World of Warcraft expansions. Choose an expansion and you'll see every dungeon from that expansion. Let's use Wrath of the Lich King as an example. This is a list of every dungeon this expansion had. Click any of them for more details. Let's go with the Nexus. On the left hand side you'll see all the boss fights in this dungeon. Click on any of them to expand the info on the right page. We'll use Grand Magus Telestra for this video. The right page is now split between three tabs. Abilities shown by this skull, loot and model. The Abilities page shows you all the attacks this boss has. Expanding any of the attacks by clicking the plus will tell you exactly what to expect from this boss. World of Warcraft is more than happy to provide you with all the information you'll need to feel prepared before any fight. If we switch the tab on the right to Loot, you'll see a list of every item this boss can drop. The Gear filter button above allows you to sort this list to only show items usable by certain classes or specialisations, useful to seeing what you can gain from this exact boss. The slot button to the right again limits the loot to only showing certain slot items. It's useful to keep this on all slots. The final tab is Model. This is simply the 3D model of the boss and can be clicked on and rotated around. Return to the Abilities tab the skull, and you'll see the button to the top right of the page with a 5 in brackets and the word normal. This is the dungeon difficulty. 
Dungeons can have various difficulties available, and you'll set the difficulty of a dungeon before you go in. You can choose between Normal, Heroic, Mythic, and in some cases, Time Walking or Challenge modes. Change that button from Normal to Heroic, and you'll notice that another boss appears. As the difficulty of a dungeon increases, extra bosses may be added, some bosses may gain additional mechanics, and the drop table improves. Switch to the Loot tab to see that Heroic drops are better than Normal drops. There are several ways to enter a dungeon. Providing you've got the right level and meet the entry requirements, you can put together a party of players and physically travel to the dungeon entrance and go in. The leader of the party will set the dungeon difficulty before the party enters. To do this as the leader, right-click your own character portrait, then select Dungeon Difficulty, and change it to either Normal, Heroic, or Mythic. If you don't have a team of people to play with available, you can use the Group Finder. Open the Group Finder by clicking the button or using the shortcut key I. Click Dungeon Finder on the left, and you'll see a list of all the dungeons you are eligible for. At the top, you'll have to select if you're queuing as a tank, healer, or DPS, and tick the flag if you feel you're able to lead the party. The drop-down menu underneath can change which type of dungeon you'd like to queue for. Selecting a dungeon from a certain expansion within the game's history, or a specific dungeon. Once you've ticked every dungeon you'd be happy to run, simply click Join Queue, and the game will begin finding you a team. There is an instance limit. An instance is a specific area generated every time you enter, such as a dungeon or a raid. You could only enter 10 instances within the hour, but until you're grinding instances endlessly for rare items, you are unlikely to hit this limit. Let's quickly talk about raids. Dungeons are usually short, five-person challenges, but raids are something different. You'll need to be much higher level for a raid, and the group size can range from 10 up to 40 people. Raids can be completed once a week. Once you've killed the raid bosses, you'll have to wait for the weekly reset. Raids have four difficulty levels. Looking for group, normal, heroic, and mythic. If you use the Dungeons and Raids Finder Raid Finder tab, you'll be placed into the Looking for Group difficulty category. This is the easiest of the four, but it's still very tough. To enter a normal, heroic, or mythic raid, you'll need to be a member of a raiding party, and have the leader manually set the difficulty. This is mostly something you'll face at the end game once you're a member of a larger guild. Mythic raiding takes months to become good at, and world firsts are hotly contested, so don't expect to be taking on those challenges anytime soon. Professions Professions are complex enough to need their own guide, so that's what I'll be doing. Keep an eye out for the complete professions guide coming soon, but here are the basics. Professions are additional skills that a player can learn to either gather useful materials or produce something beneficial. A player can learn two of the nine primary professions. These are Alchemy, needed by end-game raiding parties as it produces powerful potions. Blacksmithing, makes plate armor and weapons for warriors or paladins. Enchanting, improves the quality and increases the power of several slot items. Engineering, provides items that can increase DPS. Engineering is then further divided into the specialized gnomish or goblin engineering. Herbalism gathers and finds herbs, very good money as the herbs are needed to make potions. Leather working makes armor for male or leather armor classes. Leather working further specializes into elemental or dragon scale leather. Mining generates the raw material needed by blacksmithing and engineering. Skinning receive skin from killed mobs and provide the leather worker with the materials they need. And tailoring makes cloth robes used by magic casters. You can choose two of the above nine primary professions. 
Then there are four secondary professions, cooking, fishing, first aid, and archaeology. You can learn all four of these at the same time. Pet Battles Pet Battles are a turn-based mini-game you can play within World of Warcraft. They're not essential, and you can reach endgame without ever using or taking part in a pet battle. They're similar in some aspects to Pokemon. To start, you'll need to visit a pet battle trainer in a major city. You'll need to say you're interested in catching some rare pets, and then buy the Pet Battle Training Manual. This will unlock your first battle pet. Then click and drag any collected pet into the new slot shown on the Collections screen. Pet battles are kind of similar to any other turn-based battle game. Attacks are a certain elemental type, and each pet has strengths and weaknesses. They'll gain access to more attacks as they level up. And as you play through, you'll be able to battle various NPCs and eventually other players for experience and fame. Pet battles will have their own guide video made. As a new player, you won't need to focus on them too much. And finally, the auction house. If you've found a rare item and you don't need it, it's best to sell it. In-game merchants will give you terribly low prices, so it's best to sell it directly to another player. Hover your mouse over any item in your inventory to check if it's soul-bound or not. If it's soul-bound, it can only be used by you and can't be sold. Most items will become soul-bound after equipping them for the first time. The auction house will be located in your faction's main city, Stormwind for the Alliance and Orgrimmar for the Horde. Right-click on an auctioneer to open the window. The auction window allows you to search for items within certain parameters reducing down by level range, rarity, and whether you're able to use it or not. Choose your search criteria on the left from the expanding menus, then click search in the top right. You can then sort the list by rarity, level, time remaining on the auction, who's selling it, or the total asking price. In the bottom left, you'll see the bids and auctions tabs. Bids are all current things you're trying to buy. Auctions are all the things you're selling. When on the Auctions tab, click and drag a non-soul-bound item from your backpack to the Auction Item Empty Square to start an auction. You'll be able to set the starting price and the buyout price. This works like eBay. Starting price will start a bidding war, buyout will instantly get you the item. When you list the item, you'll see a deposit fee. If the item sells, you'll get this back but the auction house will take a small cut of the sale. If it doesn't sell, you'll get the item back, but not the deposit. Either way, you'll lose a small amount of money to the auction house. Auctions you're selling remain for sale even when you're logged off, and any sales that happen when you're offline will be sent to your mailbox. Items not sold are returned here too. There's a mailbox right outside each major auction house. Frequently asked questions. When do I get a mount? You'll gain access to your first mount at level 20. You'll need to purchase the apprentice riding skill from a riding trainer. You should be able to find one of these in your starting zone, then a basic mount. As you level up, you'll be able to buy more powerful riding skills. These are passive skills that simply increase your speed on a mount. Eventually, at level 60, you'll gain access to flying mounts. How many characters can I have on one account? You can have up to 50 characters per account on the live game, but there are some limitations, such as only one Demon Hunter per server, and WoW Classic will only allow you to have 10 characters. My membership ran out. Will my characters be deleted? No, they'll remain. If you ever decide to resubscribe, you will be able to use them again. Ending. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've made it this far through, then well done. You now know everything you need to know to begin your journey into Azeroth. There's lots more to discover, with time-walking dungeons, PvP battles, island expeditions, raids, hunting the lucid nightmare, and more. But that's all for you to find at your own speed. I hope this guide has been helpful and made you feel slightly more prepared for the massive journey ahead. If you have any feedback or opinions, feel free to leave a comment below, or come chat to me live on Twitch. I'm usually streaming a variety of games nightly over at twitch.tv forward slash Josh Strife Hayes. Thank you very much for your time. 
have a great day.